hello everyone i uh, hope all of you are uh, healthy and safe uh, so this is the second part of uh, the lecture of uh, endodontic uh, emergencies uh, the first part uh, was taken by uh, dr jalison last week so i'll just be continuing with part 2 so in part 1 you uh, dealt with uh, the basic definition of uh, endodontic emergencies and uh, the cases of endodontic emergencies when they crop up before you even start your treatment so what are the presenting cases like your cracked tooth syndrome or you know your avulsion and how to manage those cases so today uh, we are going to be dealing with the endodontic emergencies crop up during and after your endodontic treatment okay so the first thing uh, before that you should know is uh, what are flare ups so a flare up is an acute uh, exacerbation of a pathosis the periradicular pathosis after the initiation or continuation of your root canal treatment so it can be during any step after you have initiated your endodontic therapy so it may be during your access opening it can be during your cleaning and shaping it can be uh, during i mean just after your obturation as well okay so Uh, an interappointment flare up is characterized by the development of pain swelling or both uh, following endodontic intervention so you would have seen uh, in the clinics uh, when uh, we are carrying out endodontic uh, treatments we generally do it over a, a, a number of sittings instead of uh, doing it in uh, in one shot most of the cases we do in the clinics uh, by the by your seniors and by your, by your own batch would have been done in multiple visits so at the beginning of the next visit we always ask the patient how the patient is and uh, whether there was any discomfort or uh, whether the patient is okay right now for the next step sometimes you would have seen that the patient walks in with severe pain and uh, uh, that is nothing but a flare up uh, sometimes uh, even a swelling might be there so now we are going to find out why these things okay so the causative factors uh, of uh, pain they comprise the mechanical that is uh, when you yourselves are uh, using the instruments uh, the majority of the instruments the, the major bulk of them being your files chemical that could be because of uh, your irrigants which you are going to be using or the intracanal medicament also if it has been extruded beyond the apex or and uh, and or the microbial injury that is because of the bacteria caused by the in, uh, infection yeah injury to the pulp or the periradicular tissues which are induced during your endodontic therapy so regardless of the type of injury whether it be mechanical chemical or microbial uh, the intensity uh, of the response is directly proportional to the intensity of the injury so the greater you cause the the trauma the greater is going to be the inflammatory response uh, the frequency of interappointment pain uh, is significantly in higher is significantly higher in teeth with existing periradicular lesions uh as compared to teeth with vital pulps and normal periradicular tissues uh this is probably because uh, when there are uh, teeth uh, which have existing periradicular lesions uh generally uh, in those cases the minor apical constriction is already violated because of the presence of the lesion because of which you tend to lose the tactile sensation when you are approaching the uh, desired working length because of which your instrumentation or your irrigant or your intracanal medicament is generally pushed beyond the apex this uh, is uh, one of the major causes of why uh, the flare ups can happen uh, medical status of patients so of course if the patient has some underlying systemic factors like diabetes uh, hypertension or if the patient is pregnant uh, there is a chance of uh, i mean they are more prone to flare ups uh, this is of course because of the underlying uh, sugar or the blood pressure uh and uh, uh, and for the pregnant patients uh the the em- only emergency treatment uh, is supposed to be given uh, for pregnant patients uh so we prefer to delay the treatment uh in order to avoid the flare ups uh the second is considered to be the safest time to treat whereas in the first and the third we try to uh, focus only on the emergency treatment and then try to uh, you know Uh, keep the remaining invasive procedures for after the pregnancy yeah so in case if it is the first trimester you perform the endodontic uh, the emergency treatment and then you delay the treatment so that you can somehow do the remaining uh, invasive uh, therapy uh, in the second trimester uh, whereas uh, if the patient if the female is in the third trimester you try to 
delay the further in uh, invasive procedures up till uh, the end of pregnancy so then she can come and it will be safer for the fetus okay so uh, when research was conducted uh, the following back, uh, the following uh, microorganisms were isolated from the infected uh, flare up canals yeah so uh, uh, f nucleatum prevotella and porphyromonas species were frequently isolated please remember in cases of retreatment so when your endodontic therapy has failed the major causative organism is and always has been enterococcus faecalis now you have to understand that uh, battling enterococcus faecalis is not very easy uh, it is the only it is one of the only microorganisms which is actually resistant to your intracanal medicament that is your calcium hydroxide whereas all the other species uh, that is the f nucleatum the prevotella and the porphyromonas species they are all combated well by your calcium hydroxide e faecalis on the other hand is uh, quite resistant to it so even if you give a nice calcium hydroxide dressing uh, the chances of eradicating this uh, microorganism from the canal is minimal so you have to remember in all retreatment cases please always use chlorhexidine chlorhexidine the 2% chlorhexidine is the only chemical known to us which actually takes care of uh, e faecalis so uh, in some cases when uh, we see failed root canal cases we like to use the combination of chlorhexidine and calcium hydroxide so if you have calcium hydroxide powder you can actually mix it with your chlorhexidine gel and you can place it into the canal so it has a combatant synergetic effect and uh, it will take care to sterilize the canals okay so contributing factors for flare ups are inadequate debridement uh, debris extrusion beyond the canals and over instrumentation uh, instrumentation that is your uh, files are going beyond the uh, apex so inadequate debridement uh this generally happens uh when you have uh, missed a canal or you have not been able to reach up till the working length so you are inadequately inadequately uh, in, uh, instrumenting the canal uh you are not following the proper uh, the file sizes that means you are trying to skip files and uh, of course the teeth with necrotic pulps they are more prone to uh, flare ups when compared to uh, vital teeth so when you are dealing with non vital teeth please make sure that you are placing thorough amount of intracanal medicaments uh, so that the calcium hydroxide can actually take care of the uh, infection which is present in necrotic pulps okay so thorough uh, debridement of the entire root canal space uh, the removal of the entire pulpal tissue with broaches and irrigants and the placement of intracanal medicaments is the treatment for your inadequate debridement now coming to debris extrusion uh this happens uh when you know we have an over enthusiastic uh, uh dentists uh, those who are not very experienced and they tend to you know violate the minor apical constriction either with the files or when they are injecting forcefully uh the irrigants so what happens is the debris is uh, pushed out into the periapical space uh which causes the irritation to the periradicular tissues and which ultimately results in the flare up so studies have shown that uh, the conventional hand instrumentation was shown to extrude more debris than your rotary instrumentation this is because of uh, inexperienced uh, dentists who do not possess the tactile sensation yet so please understand it doesn't develop overnight so you have to keep practicing so once you develop your uh, tactile sensation and once you are uh, familiar with how to you know uh, correctly estimate your working length and you know that you are not supposed to go beyond that point this is definitely going to come down also please never ever ever force the irrigants uh from the syringe so to ensure that this doesn't happen please never allow the syringe needle to get locked inside the canal once it is locked and then when you forcefully inject the chances of extrusion beyond the apex are significantly higher okay so debris extrusion of course does occur with all techniques but uh uh the crown down technique and the balanced force technique show significantly lesser amount of debris extension so i i'm sure you are all aware of the crown down and the step back technique so the step back technique is what you are practicing when you are using your hand files so you are preparing the apical third first followed by the middle and the coronal whereas in the crown down technique the 
coronal and the middle parts are prepared first followed by the apical uh, or the uh, followed by the apical third so because of that your syringe is able to uh, enter the canal easily without getting locked in the canal because of which the chances of extrusion because of uh, excess pressure is minimized so that is why they say that the crown down technique uh, is uh, better off and shows significantly lesser amount of debris ext uh, extrusion while at the same time uh, adequately irrigating the root canals the presence of an apical dentinal plug this is formed when you are doing your cleaning and shaping so when you have established your working length and when you keep it 0.5 mm short of the apex as in when you are using the files okay as in when you are using the files to do your cleaning and shaping and when you irrigate the debris uh, uh, of course a majority of the debris is going to be flushed out from the canal but a certain amount of debris keeps settling at the apex uh, uh due to gravity especially in the mandibular uh, teeth and this debris which is settling down forms an apical dentinal plug so this also helps to prevent the debris extrusion uh, over instrumentation and over obturation because it forms a pack beyond which your file and irrigant will not be able to pass however this apical dentinal plug also can harbor infectious material because the bacteria may not be fully flushed out from the apical dentinal plug and uh, you might have your infected dentine also in there so because of which the long term prognosis may be compromised so that apical dentinal plug may prove to be a reservoir of infected uh, material which can actually go and infect the periapex so it uh, it can actually be both good and bad yeah so now coming to your over instrumentation so this leads to moderate to severe pain uh, in patients it is when you are forcefully uh, you know uh, sending the file beyond the apical constriction so it can cause uh, acute apical periodontitis uh, uh, which produces the pain so uh, when your instrument goes beyond uh, the apex of a healthy tooth and the patient walks back in with pain we term it as secondary apical periodontitis please remember it it is an important term for you people secondary apical periodontitis so in that uh, what that means is you are actually inducing apical periodontitis in the patient who was previously healthy okay so the apical periodontium is crushed which produces pain and inflammation so how do you uh, avoid your over instrumentation this is if you focus on taking your your proper working length and uh, uh, of course uh, you have to use uh, your files in a passive manner you do not push the files uh, beyond you know in excessive forces ex uh, especially when you are dealing with curved canals yeah so you have to be very very patient okay so how do you manage it you can pro uh, you can pro uh, provide the analgesics to the patient if the patient is under pain and of course uh, after you give your anesthesia you can actually proceed with your endodontic therapy except for the obturation so you can proceed to do your cleaning and shaping after you have modified your working length it is always good to reduce the uh, to do the occlusal reduction because later on when the patient goes back uh, uh, on mastication that is when the, the occluding uh, when the teeth go into occlusion this tooth is going to be out of occlusion so it's not going to come in contact with the opposing tooth because of which the patient is going to feel lesser amount of uh, discomfort so please keep in mind that uh, when you are performing your access opening the next step should be occlusal reduction if you decide to do your occlusal reduction at a later point of time your working length is going to be altered because you are going to be uh, taking the working length immediately after your access opening so if you forget to do your occlusal reduction then your working length is going to be altered so that is why as soon as you finish your access opening it is good to perform your Uh, occlusal reduction in any case you are going to be producing uh, you are going to be supplying the prosthetic component that is your crown so the occlusal reduction at that point of time is actually going to be useful uh, even in the future because you that much less amount of uh, crown prep has to be done uh, in the next appointment yeah okay so how do you test for over instrumentation in case if your canal has been over instrumented that means you have lost the minor apical constriction So the way to test it is you grasp a paper point uh, and mark it 2 mm more than your working length. The paper point will then pass easily without any obstruction. Of course, uh, you cannot use a very large paper point. You have to use a paper point one size smaller or equal to the last file which you have used in the canal to the working length. 
so this paper point will pass without any obstruction and when you withdraw this paper point there will be a reddish brown discoloration of the tip which present uh, which indicates the presence of exudate and uh, inflamed tissue so that shows that you have instrumented the canal of course if uh, you place the paper point in a canal which has not been instrumented thoroughly it could also mean that the uh, the paper point has come in contact with inflamed pulp so you have to make sure that uh, you are doing it only after you have actually performed your cleaning and shaping okay now secondary apical periodontitis is what i was t uh, telling you about so in in cases when the patient was actually healthy and you have performed your cleaning and shaping and the next appointment the patient walks in with pain on chewing and biting that means you have induced secondary apical periodontitis uh, because of which the patient is having uh, tenderness to percussion so in these cases it is uh, what you have to do is you have to prescribe your uh, uh, analgesics and for symptomatic pain relief uh, you can irrigate the canals and you can apply a corticosteroid antibiotic paste as your intracanal medicament instead of your uh, calcium hydroxide because the corticosteroids will reduce the inflammation in that area so it will provide uh, the soothing relief which the patient desires okay so how to prevent the over instrumentation this is what i said you have to uh, make sure that your uh, working length is intact and you are not supposed to force the instrument uh into the canal so you're supposed to use passive force yeah okay another reason for your secondary apical periodontitis could be the choice of your intracanal medicament as well so in the earlier days we used to have uh, formaldehyde or formocrisol intracanal medicaments these uh, intracanal medicaments used to be toxic and they used to uh, i mean pass through the the apex of the tooth and go into the periradicular tissues which used to cause uh damage to them and because of which uh, the the tissues used to get degenerated and the patient used to have uh, pain pain so now coming to uh, the sodium hypochlorite accident as you can see in the photograph it's not a pleasant state uh sodium hypochlorite is extremely uh, toxic to your uh, uh, periapical tissues so when you are using your sodium hypochlorite first of all uh, the use of the rubber dam is mandatory uh, because the taste and the smell of the sodium hypochlorite uh, is really really bad and the patient can uh, will start coughing violently and uh, uh, might even start gagging and might want to even throw up because of the the taste and the smell so using the rubber dam is absolutely mandatory and of course uh, you can never never push sodium hydroxide uh, sorry hypochlorite sodium hypochlorite beyond uh, the apex because the patient will immediately complain of the following symptoms if the sodium hypochlorite has gone beyond so the patient will have severe pain it is excruciating pain okay uh, the patient will immediately develop swelling and discoloration as you can see because uh, that is because of the bleeding in the interstitial tissues and the patient will also show uh, discharge from the tooth as well so sometimes you can see the bleeding through the canal as well if the bleeding is really really severe so in such cases how are you supposed to manage the tooth uh, okay so before that uh, uh, you just have a look at the causes what causes the sodium hypochlorite uh, accident to occur it is because of the forceful injection so what happens is if your irrigating needle is wedged into your canal so this is one of the drawbacks of your step back technique so when you are doing your apical preparation the coronal third is not really uh, well prepared because of which the irrigating needle cannot sit uh, cannot enter snugly into the root canal because of which the crown down technique is always prepared uh, always preferred especially when you are uh, uh, you doing your irrigation yeah so uh, this can cause the wedging of the irrigating needle if the needle is wedged in or locked into the canal please do not irrigate you have to make sure that the needle is loose in the canal and only then you are supposed to passively push the uh the plunger of the uh, syringe otherwise there is a very good chance that your uh, irrigant is going to be extruded beyond also when you are dealing with teeth with large apical foramen such as the cases of your maxillary anteriors or in the case of an immature apex or if you are dealing with resorb uh, apical resorption cases please be very very careful when you are using your 
uh, sodium hypochlorite because the chances of extrusion are significantly higher. So, of course, the features are the edema, uh, the patient will have the swelling and ecchymosis is the pinpoint uh, bleedings which you can see, uh, the, the redness in the area uh, accompanied by the necrosis of the tissue. Uh, the patient will lose, uh, will also suffer from paresthesia in the later stages. So, the patient will have numbness because of the damage of, uh, uh, damage caused by the sodium hypochlorite. And although the patients will recover within one to two weeks, the paresthesia may extend for a, uh, for a long time. So how to manage the case? So if you have actually, uh, you know, if the patient immediately uh, complains of pain, uh, you have to assume that the irrigant has gone beyond uh, at that point of time. So immediately uh, what you have to do is you have to aspirate. So when you aspirate, it causes a negative pressure because of which uh, some amount of your sodium hypochlorite will actually get sucked into the canal, uh, into the syringe and outside uh, the canal. So that is the first step which you have to do. The next immediate step what you have to do is you have to give a nerve block. Please keep in mind infiltration will not work at this point of time. You have to give a regional nerve block. So in the cases of mandible, you have to give your uh, inferior alveolar nerve block. Okay. So please remember infiltrations will not help at this point of time. Please administer your regional nerve block. The next step what you can do is you can reduce the concentration and neutralize the effect of your sodium hypochlorite by flushing the canals with your normal saline. What happens is your sodium hypochlorite gets diluted in that area. Then you have to monitor the tooth for the next half an hour. Uh, bloody exudation can uh, be seen from the canals. It may not happen all the time, but it can be seen from the canal. It only denotes that the body is actually trying to react to the irrigant. So keep removing it with uh, saline, keep flushing it out with saline and using high volume suction to encourage your further drainage. Then of course, when the patient is going back, you can prescribe your cold pack for the first 24 hours. Yeah. So this helps to reduce the uh, amount of post-op swelling. Uh, please remember that post 24 hours, we do not uh, generally use uh, cold pack. We tend to switch over to hot packs because after 24 hours, we want to stimulate healing by increasing the blood flow. So the first 24 hours, we only use cold. We do not use hot because it will cause an increase in the swelling. So this is a very confusing point. Please try to understand this. The first 24 hours, we only use cold therapy, that is to reduce the swelling. We do not use hot or heat because we do not want to cause an increase in the swelling because what happens is the blood circulation will increase and the swelling will actually increase in size. The next 24, after the first 24 hours, the swelling, the chances of the swelling to increase are minimal. So what we do is uh, we can slowly wean away from your cold pack and we can actually go to uh, hot packs because that will actually help in the healing because the blood circulation will increase and the blood circulation will actually remove the toxic elements and the exudates from that area. So that is how you're supposed to do it. Of course, you have to uh, give your antibiotic coverage and your analgesics as well. You can give corticosteroids because it will help to reduce the inflammation in that area. And uh, like I said, the cold and the warm compress have to be given. So how to prevent this uh, sodium hypochlorite accident or extrusion of any irrigant for that matter? You have to bend the irrigating needle at the center. So what happens is most of the cases I have seen that the irrigating needle has been bent right at the tip of the, uh, the, the nib. Uh, the plastic nib. So that uh, what happens in uh, in that case is the the needle uh, the length is long because of which it can actually go and get stuck in the middle in the middle of the apical third. So you bend the irrigating needle at the center because uh, the canal is definitely wider in the coronal third. So only a short amount a short portion of the needle is actually going to be going because you're bending it right at the middle of the length of the needle. So in those cases the binding of the needle is going to be reduced yeah and keep moving the needle as you are irrigating so keep moving it in an inward outward direction so that you know that your needle is not getting locked into the canal so that your irrigant can flow freely inside the root canal okay please always use pass passive pressure do not 
uh, do not push or force the irrigant out needle okay so the next is hydrogen peroxide although this is not used uh, uh, as much as it used to be at one point of time uh, it did of course cause uh, uh, injury to the interstitial tissues and the periapical tissues so uh, at one point of time 3% of hydrogen peroxide used to be used as an intracanal irrigant so uh, the extrusion of which used to cause uh, the pain and emphysema yeah so uh, i mean uh, in those cases you are suppose uh, the patient will also have facial swelling and tenderness and uh, because of which uh, the same management has to follow like how we explained for uh, the sodium hypochlorite accident so you have to give your antimicrobial therapy and your uh, uh, analgesic therapy and uh, of course uh, this does recover over a time period of 2 weeks now air emphysema although it is rare the cases have been reported and the most common uh, possibility of air emphysema is when you are trying to dry the canal so please 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 never ever ever use uh, compressed air to dry your root canal because it can lead to air emphysema although it is rare but there is a certain amount of risk so to dry the canal it is always best to use either your paper points or to use your cotton pellets uh, to dry the uh, pulp chambers okay so please never use uh, air pressure yeah uh, okay so the next one is your aspiration or ingestion of endodontic instruments this is only because of the negle uh, negligence of the dentist and uh, the assistant so primarily of the dentist so the only way to uh, prevent the aspiration of uh, the instruments is first and foremost you have to use a rubber dam and the second is you can actually tie the instrument uh, with a floss uh, and let the floss be hanging outside while you are using the file of course this is a tedious procedure you cannot actually tie each file and each component of uh, instruments which are being introduced into the canal so uh, the rubber dam is the most secure way to prevent the aspiration of instruments please remember if an instrument is swallowed by the patient the chances of you getting uh, sued or uh, confronted by a lawsuit are very very high because this is purely the negligence of your dentist yeah so please make sure that you are using a uh, rubber dam in all cases now coming to perforations so the perforation is nothing but an artificial opening in the tooth or the root which is created by the clinician during your cleaning and shaping uh, so the locations of your perforations can be either subgingival that is just below the gingiva in the mid root or in the apical uh, apical third of the canal Uh, the smaller the defect uh, the better the prognosis however uh, the mid root and the apical uh, uh, perforations uh, the repair is quite difficult because it might have to be uh, it not might most probably has to be managed surgically the subgingival to some extent yes it can be managed without surgery however the smaller the size the better the prognosis so the coronal third perforations Uh, it generally happens because of excessive uh, uh, drilling by the clinician either for locating the canal orifices or uh, during your post and core uh, preps so what happens is you can actually uh, uh, you know uh, damage the furcation area or the furcal area of the tooth leading to perforation so what are the materials you can use uh, to repair your furcation damage uh you have mineral trioxide aggregate that is your mta you have biodentin these are the recent uh, recent advances of course you also have your calcium hydroxide gic uh at one point of time uh, amalgam also used to be used but we do not prefer that now because uh, because of the toxic effects of the mercury and also because of the discoloration which is caused because of the corrosion products as well yeah so we prefer to use gic calcium hydroxide and mta and biodentin have superior results when compared to calcium hydroxide so calcium hydroxide will actually control the bleeding and it is left for a few days because of which the bleeding is suppressed and then you can actually uh, inspect the site and place your uh, gic or mta or biodentin coming to the mid root perforations uh, this is done uh, 
uh, in the middle portion of the tooth and generally it is caused uh, when you are uh, doing your filing in an aggressive manner so you have to perform something known as anti curvature filing so if the file is curved in the uh, mesial direction you have to do your filing in the uh, while giving pressure in the distal direction so that you do not uh, you know thin out the mesial wall which is already thin especially when it comes to the lower molars uh, the mesiobuccal canal is actually curved mesially so you have to give more pressure on the distal aspect so this will come with experience so that you do not thin out or perforate the uh, the canal yeah so mid root and apical third perforations they have to be dealt with surgically so that is even more complex uh, now coming to stripping it is a lateral perforation which is caused by over instrumentation the same thing has to be done for stripping you have to uh, perform your uh, to prevent your uh, stripping you have to perform your anti curvature filing so how do you know that you have perforated uh, while you are doing your perforation suddenly your pulp chamber will be flooded with blood so then you will know that you have actually caused a perforation in the mid root so to prevent that you have to perform your anti curvature filing since the access is difficult uh, the repair is also of course difficult and the prognosis is poor so you have to uh, head over to uh, the surgical uh, repair yeah so uh, to prevent uh, the stripping like i said you have to do your anti curvature filing uh, maintain maintain your mesial pressure do not go overboard when you are doing your filing and when you are using your rotary files please be careful when you are using rotary files do not force them uh, into the canals now coming to your apical perforation this is very very common it generally happens when your apical third is actually blocked because of the presence of debris and inexperienced operators they tend to push the file instead of trying to passively negotiate the blockage and uh, what happens is uh, it leads to an apical perforation so your working length is going to change and the exit of the root canal also changes because instead of happening uh, at the desired working length it is happening later than it yeah and now coming to emergencies during endodontic surgery so uh, once endodontic surgery is uh, covered for you people uh, you will uh, uh, you uh, if you have seen any of the cases of endodontic surgery uh, of course there is a certain amount of uh, bleeding which does happen because it is an invasive procedure however uh, when you are giving your local anesthesia uh, if you have given a sufficient amount you will see that the bleeding will be minimal yes but during the process you might encounter rebound phenomenon so i have mentioned an article which is here given by steven and richard so you can read about your rebound phenomenon uh, in in detail in this chapter so it is uh, i can explain in short what it, it is nothing but uh, the the wearing off of the effect of your la uh, with time because of which the the area which has been surgically exposed will get flooded with uh, blood and exudate again so the only way to prevent it is uh, you have to be quick and you have to keep giving uh, anesthesia uh, time and again before you know that the anesthetic effect is going to wear out so if your procedure is taking you know 1 and 1/2 to 2 hours uh, it would be preferable if you can actually uh, anesthetize every half an hour or uh, you know uh, every 40 minutes you keep giving additional doses of anesthesia so that the rebound phenomenon does not occur yeah the healing after the rebound phenomenon has occurred is much more difficult so it is always uh, better to uh, prevent it and of course uh, medical emergencies which happen during endodontic treatment is your syncope and hypoglycemic shock so this can be combated uh, when you uh, if you just uh, you know uh, make the patient lie down in the trendelberg position so the blood flow to the brain increases and the patient recover yes now coming to the flare ups post your endodontic treatment this is uh, nothing but your over extension or your under extension of uh, your treat uh, your uh, filling material or your files or because of your missed canal so the underfilling of course uh, as you can see in the in the radiograph uh, in the page uh, it is because you have not uh, uh, obturated the canal till the desired working length so in these cases you have to 
uh, redo the entire procedure. So you have to remove the existing GP and you have to negotiate the canal uh, till the desired working length and then you have to obturate. So then uh, the leash will be taken care of. Overfilling is either because uh, of your root canal sealer or it can be because of your gutta percha. So in the case that uh, the gutta percha has extended beyond your apex, yes, in those cases the patient will complain of foreign body reaction and pain because of which the gutta percha has to be removed and the obturation has to be done again. In the case the root canal sealer has extruded beyond the apex, there is actually no need to do the treatment again because uh, it will be removed by the body itself. So how do you differentiate when it is a root canal sealer and when it is a gutta percha? Uh, it is very simple. Uh, gutta percha will extrude beyond in a straight line because uh, gutta percha is uh, a solid. It is uh, your gutta percha cone. Whereas the root canal sealer, it will look more like a cloud. So you can see it like an apical puff. So you will know clearly that uh, the, the sealer has extruded beyond the apex. Also, the sealer, uh, you can appreciate it uh, decreasing in size on a weekly basis until it finally disappears. Whereas the gutta percha uh, is going to be there uh, uh, throughout. So it is best to remove the gutta percha and do the obturation again. So if you are not able to remove the gutta percha, you have to, uh, by non-invasive methods, that is uh, by your traditional root canal methods, uh, in those cases, you will have to do your surgery. So now coming to the analgesics and antibiotics uh, which are commonly prescribed in, in uh, endodontics, please uh, understand that antibiotics are prescribed only in cases when there is uh, an abscess or when there is actual exudate or, uh, an, uh, or, uh, uh, or a sinus. So in these cases, yes, you have to prescribe antibiotics, but other than that, we do not have the principle of prescribing antibiotics in endodontics. So the most common uh, antibiotic which uh, we prescribe is, of course, the group of penicillins. Amoxicillin is uh, the clear choice. So we prescribe it thrice a day for a period of five, uh, five days. It can extend plus or minus two days. So if we feel that the patient will, uh, will heal fast, so then we may prescribe it for only three days or if there is a persistent infection we might extend it for a period of seven days so other than uh, amoxicillin we also use metronidazole in the cases of abscess cases so please remember the dosage of metronidazole uh, is 400 mg and it is prescribed uh, thrice daily for a period of seven days so these are given in long-standing abscess cases when uh, we can see the purulent discharge is also there. In those cases, amoxicillin may not be sufficient, so it is clubbed with uh, metronidazole. And uh, yeah, of course, we also have our NSAIDs. So we generally do prescribe uh, ibuprofen for severe cases of pain, or we can go ahead with your paracetamol for mild cases. Yeah. So this brings us to the conclusion of the endodontic emergencies. Uh, if you have any doubts, uh, please feel free to uh, comment in the comment section or you can always get in touch with me at any point of time. Uh, I hope uh, this uh, lecture has brought some light to the important uh, issues which uh, you might be facing or you will be facing in the department of endodontics or when you are dealing with patients in your clinics. So uh, I, I hope I was able to shed some light on it. Uh, okay, so that's all from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Stay safe and take care.